Hello, fellow Sojourners, and thanks for tuning in to our 20th episode of Appropriating the Culture. Each week for 20 weeks, we have provided you with analysis and insight into the segments of society that shape and plague our culture, and have done so with charming wry humor, wit, and a degree of whimsy. Some people said it couldn't be done, more people said it shouldn't be done, and for 20 weeks I have endured a slew of hate mail, death threats, and burning effigies of me. Not really. But we all want to be heroic, we all want to be noble, we all want to be virtuous, and the easiest way to do that in our culture is to be a victim, which is our topic today. I'm Pastor Shane, I'll be your hate crime hoaxer today as we appropriate some culture. You might have noticed a disquieting trend of hate crime hoaxes in our society. Some of them got national attention, like the case of Jesse Smollett, the gay black actor on Fox's Empire, who went out to buy food from a subway shop in the middle of a blizzard on the night of January 29, at which point Mr. Smollett claimed that two white men attacked him, punched him, poured a chemical substance on him, and fastened a rope around his neck while hurling racial and homophobic slurs at him and screaming, this is MAGA country. An outpouring of support followed from notable Hollywood stars. Smollett was interviewed on ABC, and politicians like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker labeled it a modern-day lynching. But the two white men turned out to be two black men. MAGA country turned out to be Chicago. And Jesse Smollett turned out to be a bad actor. Though if you watched Empire, that was already kind of a spoiler. Smollett paid people to harass him after his first hoax, a letter with racial and homophobic slurs and containing crushed aspirin, didn't garner the attention he was looking for. But this high-profile modern-day lynching is surprisingly not that uncommon. In 2016, The Atlantic wrote that a black church burned in the name of Trump. Hopewell Missionary Baptist Church in Greenville, Mississippi was reportedly set on fire and spray-painted with the words, Vote Trump, on Tuesday night. About a month later, that story was updated when the police arrested Andrew McClinton, apparently a member of the church, who set it on fire and painted the words, Vote Trump. Not entirely sure how setting fire to your own church would encourage people to vote Trump, but you know, it's aggressive, grassroots campaigning, I guess. A similar incident occurred in the same year when St. David's Episcopal Church was vandalized with the words, Heil Trump! Turns out it was the organist with a spray can in the nuthouse. The organist said he wanted to mobilize a movement after being disappointed in and fearful of the outcome of the national election. Also in 2016, a Muslim woman claimed that three white drunk men harassed her on the subway in New York. They shouted, Donald Trump, and tried to forcefully remove her hijab. She said, it made me really sad after when I thought about it. People were looking at me and looking at what was happening, and no one said a thing. They just looked away. Boy, that is sad. Even in your imagination, no one likes you. Because as it turns out, after an investigation, she confessed that she made the whole thing up. Another Muslim woman in Louisiana claimed that men yelled racial slurs at her and stole both her wallet and her hijab. Turns out she made it up and was charged with filing a false police report. In 2016, a bisexual senior at North Park University claimed to be the target of hateful notes and online harassment. Homophobic slurs were taped to her door and hate-filled anonymous emails were sent her way. But it turns out she was writing to herself and saying really mean things. A Philadelphia woman posted on social media that she was harassed by white men who used the N-word and one of them pulled a gun on her. Once the post started going viral, she deleted it and said that the men were caught and facing criminal charges. But the local police said they don't know what she's talking about. In Denton, Texas, a man and his wife awoke to find their truck and motorcycle engulfed in flames and spray painted on the garage door were the words inward lovers. They later confessed to being guilty of loving too much, also for setting their cars on fire and vandalizing their own door. Of course, if it's their property, is it really vandalism? At St. Olaf College in Minnesota, students took to protesting and classes were canceled after a racist and threatening note was placed on a car. The president of the college later revealed that the individual confessed and the note was fabricated to, quote, draw attention to concerns about the campus climate, the chief concern being hate crime hoaxes. The Air Force Academy got in on the action after finding some racist notes, which led to a fiery speech from Lieutenant General Jay Silveria. We have an opportunity here 
5,500 people in this room to think about what we are as an institution. This is our institution and no one can take away our values. No one can write on a board and question our values. No one can take that away from us. So just in case you're unclear on where I stand on this topic, I want to leave you with my most important thought today. If you can't treat someone with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. If you can't teach someone from another gender, whether that's a man or a woman, with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. If you demean someone in any way, then you need to get out. And if you can't treat someone from another race or a different color skin with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. Two months later, it was confirmed that one of the cadets who was targeted by the racist remarks was actually responsible for the act. And later, Lieutenant General J. Silveria nuked a windmill. But in fairness, he thought it was a dragon. A student at Kansas State University filed a police report over graffiti on his car that said things like, Go home, inward boy, and whites only. You know where this is going. The student later admitted to writing it himself. A waiter in Texas posted a picture on Facebook alleging that in lieu of a tip, he received a note that said, I don't tip terrorists. The waiter later confessed, saying, I did write it. I don't have an explanation. I made a mistake. There is no excuse for what I did. Here's a tip. Don't make up hate crimes. But unfortunately, another Texas waitress didn't get that memo. She alleged that an employee of the sheriff's department left a hateful, racist remark against Hispanic people on the receipt. The waitress later admitted the hateful remark was a forgery, but rest assured, the sheriff employee received real hate messages. And this is just a sliver of the hate crime hoaxes that have happened. I could literally go on and on and on with example after example after example. Which leads me to our sponsor today. Appropriate in the Culture is brought to you by a hate crime handy dandy float chart. Wondering if something is a hate crime? Follow this helpful chart. Don't get fooled by hoaxes any longer with the hate crime handy dandy flow chart. Now, obviously, hate crimes do happen. In Philadelphia, the Rocky statue was defaced with a Tom Brady jersey, though the perpetrators of this hate crime have not yet been brought to justice. But seriously, real hate crimes do happen. People are targeted because of their race or religion or politics or orientation. As we said last week, the Jewish population consistently tops the charge as victims of hate crimes, and there's been an uptick of racial crimes against Asians as well. These things do happen in diverse populations. But the fact that people have to fabricate their own hate crimes is an indication that this is not as prevalent or ubiquitous as some make it out to be. America is not as racist, bigoted, or intolerant as people seemingly want it to be, and that's a good thing. But there's an interesting psychology at play here. What motivates these people to make up this stuff? I think to understand this, we have to see that in our culture, victimhood has become a virtue. We do admire martyrs. We admire virtuous people who stood their ground in the face of persecution and sacrificed even their lives for a noble cause. But our culture learned all the wrong lessons of history. And in error, we have concluded that those who were oppressed for their virtues were virtuous because they were oppressed. But that's getting it the wrong way round. Biblically, not all suffering is virtuous. First Peter but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. See, it's not just that you're oppressed or that you're a victim. The why matters. The reason matters. We erect statues to people like Martin Luther King Jr., not because he was killed, not because he was oppressed, but because his oppression and persecution was in service to a just and noble cause. That's what makes it heroic. It's not just that he suffered, it's what he did and why he suffered that makes it noble and virtuous. But victimhood in our culture is the supreme virtue, which is why we tear down statues of flawed men who did great things and put up monuments of flawed men who were great victims. Victimhood is the supreme virtue, which is why Nancy Pelosi uh, bizarrely thanked George Floyd for his death. Thank you, George Floyd, 
for sacrificing your life for justice. Now, regardless of what you actually think of the merits of the case, George Floyd didn't sacrifice his life. His life was taken from him. And that might be tragic, but it's not heroic. He wasn't standing up for a cause. He wasn't fighting for justice. It wasn't a display of courage or bravery. It wasn't an action of nobility or any virtue. And that's not to slight him. Most of us aren't heroes. It's hard to be heroic. That's why we build statues of those people to begin with. It's hard to be noble. It's hard to be virtuous, particularly in the face of persecution. But it's easy to be a victim. And that's why it's so alluring to us. You too can be virtuous, heroic, and noble, a saint even, and all you have to do is be a victim. And that's pretty simple to do. Someone was rude to you at the DMV? It's not because they were having a bad day. It's because of the color of your skin, or your gender, or your sexual orientation, or your religion, or your politics. We're all competing in the oppression Olympics because victimhood is the greatest virtue. And if the world is not victimizing you enough, then you might be tempted to fake it. Well, we'll talk more about the effect of valuing victimhood next week. In the meantime, if you want to victimize me, you can leave me your hate-filled messages on all the basic social media platforms, and I'll see you back here next week for more appropriate in the culture.